Hi, so for this video, we'll be going to mainly discuss about the current three, which is about fidelity. Okay, so fidelity pertains to a lawyer's duty to uphold the constitution and the laws of the land, to assist in the administration of justice as an officer of the court, and to advance or defend a client's cause with full devotion, genuine interest, and zeal in the pursuit of truth and uh, justice. So in section 1, uh, the practice of law has been defined as the rendition of legal service or performance of acts or the application of law, legal principles, and judgment in or out of court with regard to the circumstances or objectives of a person or a cause and pursuant to a lawyer-client relationship or other government co uh, governed by the code of professional uh, responsibility and accountability for lawyers. So it includes employment in the public service or private sector and requires membership in the Philippine Bar as qualification. So that is uh, practice of law. It also means, okay, any activity in or out of court which requires the application of law legal procedure, knowledge, training, and experience. To quote in Cayetana v. Monsod, to engage in the practice of law is to perform those acts uh, to perform those acts which are characteristics of the profession. Generally, to practice law is to give notice or render any kind of service mm -hmm. which device or service requires the use of in any degree of legal knowledge or skill. In the practice of this profession, so a licensed attorney at law generally engages in three principal types of professional activity. We have legal advice and instructions to clients, which is to inform them of their rights and obligations. We also have preparation for clients of documents requiring knowledge of legal principles not possessed by ordinary layman. And Lastly, appearance for clients before public tribunals which possess power and authority to determine rights of life, liberty, and property according to law in order to assist in proper interpretation and enforcement of the law. So, there are also some factors which are considered in determining whether there is practice of law. Okay, we have habituality which implies customarily or habitually holding oneself out to the public as a lawyer. Okay. Another is application of law, legal principles, practice, or procedure, which calls for legal knowledge, training, and experience. We also have compensation, which implies that one must have presented himself to be in the active and continued practice of the legal profession and that his professional uh, services are available to the public for compensation and as a service for his livelihood or in consideration of his said services. Attorney-client relationship is uh, also one of the factors. We also have uh, uh, yeah, I think that's it. Huh? So we also have to discuss the uh, Practice of law as a privilege, not as a right. Okay, why is it said to be as a matter of privilege, not a right? So it's not a property right, but a mere privilege, and as such, must bow to the inherent regulatory power of the court to exact compliance with the law's public responsibilities. The right to practice law is not a natural or constitutional right. Okay. So it is also in the nature of a right because lawyers cannot be prevented from practicing law except for valid reasons observing due process. And law profession is not a business or trade because it's not a money-making venture. So kung gusto mong yumaman, okay, wag ka mag lawyer or wag ka maging attorney. Because it is a calling impressed with public interest. It's a not a right vichure. It cannot be assigned or inherited, but must be earned by hard study and good conduct. It contemplates a succession of acts of the same nature, habitually or customarily, 
holding oneself to the public as a lawyer. It is a profession and not a business, a profession in the pursuit of which pecuniary reward is merely incidental. Okay, so public service above all, no? money is not our priority. So to cite some cases, okay, we have Caronan versus Caronan, the issue is a 2016 case. That the issue in this case is whether or not the IBP erred in ordering that the name Patrick A. Caronan be stricken of the role of attorneys and the name Richard A. Caronan be barred from being admitted to the bar. The Supreme Court held no that the IBP was also correct in ordering the respondent whose real name is Richard A. Caronan be barred from admission to the bar. Under Section, uh, Section 6, Rule 138 of the Rules of Court, no applicant for admission to the bar examination shall be admitted unless he had pursued and satisfactorily completed a pre-law course. And the court does not discount the possibility that a respondent may later on complete his college education and earn a law degree under his real name. However, his false assumption of his brother's name, identity, and educational records renders him unfit for admission to the bar. The practice of law, after all, is not a natural, absolute, or constitutional right to be granted to everyone who demands it. Rather, it is a privilege limited to citizens of good moral character. Okay, we have the case of Spasis Torrentino versus Sancheta. So, despite receipt of uh, 30,000 peso of settlement suite, he did not act on his client's case. Moreover, he prevailed upon complaints to give him 200,000 pesos purportedly to be used to bribe the justices of the Court of Appeals in order to secure a favorable ruling, probably showing that the, uh, he himself was not convinced of the merits of the case. Because a lawyer shall not, for any corrupt motive or interest, encourage any suit or proceeding or delay any man's cause. A lawyer agenda's misconduct betrays his lack of appreciation that the practice of law is a profession, not a money-making trade. So, let's define lawyer-client relationship under Section 3. So, a lawyer-client relationship is of the highest fiduciary character. As a trust relation, it is essential that the engage engagement is founded on the confidence reposed by the client on the lawyer. Therefore, a lawyer-client relationship shall arise when the client consciously, voluntarily, and in good faith vests a lawyer with the client's confidence for the purpose of rendering legal services, such as providing legal advice or representation, and the lawyer, whether expressly or impliedly, agrees to render such services. That is lawyer-client relationship. How about uh, conflict of interest under section 13 up until 22? So yeah, uh, lawyers have the duty not to represent conflicting interests. So the exception is by written consent of all the concerned given after a full disclosure of facts. So in the process of determining whether there is conflict of interest, an important criterion is probability, not certainty of conflict. There is certainty of conflict, uh, or rather there is conflict of interest when a lawyer represents inconsistent or opposing interests of two or more persons. The test is whether in behalf of one client, it is the lawyer's duty to fight for an issue or claim, but which is his or her duty to oppose for the other client. Prohibition against conflict of interest representation for current clients. So in relation to current clients, the following rules shall be observed. Okay, a lawyer shall not enter into a business transaction with a client or knowingly acquire an ownership, possessory, security, or other pecuniary interest adverse to a client unless it is shown that the transaction and the terms on which the lawyer acquires the interest are fair and reasonable to the client and are fully disclosed and transmitted in writing in a manner that can be reasonably understood by the client. Okay, number two is that the client is advised in writing of the desirability of seeking and is given a reasonable opportunity to seek 
the advice of another independent lawyer on the transaction and the client gives written informed consent to the uh, essential terms of the transaction and the lawyer's role in the transaction, including whether the lawyer is representing the client in the transaction. Next is that a lawyer shall not use confidential information relating to representation of a client without the client's written informed consent, except as permitted or required by the law or the CPRA. Next, a lawyer shall not, by undue influence, acquire any substantial gift from a client, including a testamentary gift or prepare on behalf of a client an instrument giving the lawyer such gift directly or indirectly. Next is that unless with the writ, uh, written informed consent of the client and subject to the application of the subject is rule, a lawyer shall not make or negotiate an agreement giving the lawyer lit, uh, literary or media rights to a, portray, a portrayal or account based in substantial part on information relating to the representation. Next, a lawyer shall not accept compensation for representing a client from any person other than the client unless the client gives written informed consent. Number two, there is no interference with the lawyer's independence or professional judgment or with the lawyer-client relationship. Or number three, the, the information relating to the uh, representation of a client is protected as required by the rule on privilege communication. And lastly, a lawyer who represents two or more clients in the same case, in case there is a settlement or plea bargaining, shall disclose to all the clients the existence and nature of all the claims or pleas involved and the participation of each client in the settlement or plea bargaining. A lawyer also have the duty to avoid testifying in behalf of his client. Okay, so that's the general rule. A lawyer shall avoid testifying in behalf of his client. Exception to this rule is that on formal matters such as the mailing, authentication of, custody of an instrument, or uh, substantial matters in cases where his testimony is essential to the end of justice, in which event he must, during his testimony, entrust the trial of the case to another counsel. Okay, so another thing, for conflict of interest of a lawyer hired, hired by a law firm, like when a lawyer joins a law firm, it shall be the duty of the lawyer to disclose to the law firm at the earliest possible opportunity his or her previous clients that may have a potential conflict of interest with the current clients of the law firm. If there is a potential conflict of interest, the lawyer shall not act on the case or cases of the affected current client. You have the prohibition against dating, okay, romantic or sexual relations with a client. And the lawyer shall not have dating, romantic or sexual relations with a date, ah, sorry, with a client during the engagement unless the consensual relationship existed between them before the lawyer-client relationship commenced. Okay, tandaan nyo yan, ha? So, dapat, nag-exist na siya before the lawyer-client relationship commenced. Okay, in relation to prospective clients, the following rules shall be observed. So, first, the lawyer shall, at the earliest opportunity, ascertain the existence of any conflict of interest between the prospective client and current clients, and immediately disclose the same if found to exist. In case of an objection by either the prospective or current client, the lawyer shall not accept the new engagement. So a lawyer shall maintain the private confidences of a prospective client even if no engagement materializes and shall not use any such information to further his or her own interest or the interest of any current client. In relation to former clients, uh, the following rules shall be observed. First, a lawyer shall maintain the private confidences of a former client even after the termination of the engagement, except upon the written informed consent of the former client or as otherwise allowed under the CPRA or other applicable laws or regulations, or when the information has become generally known. 
Next, that a lawyer shall not use information relating to the former representation except as the CPRA or applicable laws and regulations would permit or require with respect to a current or prospective client or when the information has become generally known. Also, unless the former client gives written informed consent, a lawyer who has represented such client in a legal matter shall not thereafter represent a prospective client in the same or related legal matter where the prospective client's interests are materially adverse to the former client's interests. For corporate lawyers, there can also be a conflict of interest that in relation to organizational clients, a lawyer who represents a corporation or any organization does not, by virtue of such representation, necessarily represent any constituent or affiliated organization, such as a parent or subsidiary. So a lawyer for a corporation or other organization who is also a member of its board of directors or trustees shall determine whether the responsibilities of the two roles may conflict. In the event of the, that there is a conflict, the lawyer shall disclose the conflict of interest to all concerned parties. So for legal uh, services organization, for there to be a conflict of interest, okay? So a legal services uh, organization is any private organization including a legal aid clinic, partnership, association, or corporation whose primary purpose is to provide free legal services. And a lawyer-client relationship shall arise only between the client and the handling lawyers of the legal uh, services organization. Okay. Uh, so yeah. And all the lawyers of the legal services organization who participated in the handling of a legal matter shall be covered by the rule on conflict of interest and confidentiality. Lawyers in the government service, okay, this also could be a conflict of interest. So a lawyer currently serving in the government shall not practice law privately unless otherwise authorized by the constitution, the law, or applicable civil service rules and regulations. If allowed, private practice shall be upon the express authority of the lawyer superior for a stated specified purpose or engagement and only during an approved leave of absence. However, the lawyer shall not represent an interest adverse to the government. Public, uh, public attorney's office or POW can also be a conflict of interest. So the POW is the primary legal aid service uh, office of the government in the pursuit of its mandate under its charter uh, the public attorney's office shall ensure ready access to its services by the marginalized sectors of society in a manner that takes into consideration the avoidance of potential conflict of interest situations which will leave these marginalized parties unassisted by counsel a conflict of interest of any of the lawyers of the POW incident to services rendered to, for the office shall be imputed only to the said lawyer and the lawyer's direct supervisor. Such conflict of interest shall not disqualify the rest of the lawyers from the POW from representing the affected client upon full disclosure to the latter and written informed consent. Okay. So, for the next part, we'll be discussing uh, uh, related cases. Okay, so let's continue. Uh, this is regarding the request of uh, PAU in 2023 case. So, the court is not pers persuaded by the PAU's admission that Section 22, Canon 3 of the CPRA violates the Equal Protection Clause. Section 22, Canon 3, did not distinguish indigent clients from paying clients. What the CPRA considered in making a distinction under this section is the nature and purpose of the POW and those of private law firms. There are stark differences between the two, whereas a private law, uh, law firm laboring under a conflict of interest can be replaced by another law firm or even a solo practitioner engaged by the potential paying client. Indigents who count solely on the POW do not have any option. 
Okay, in section 22, current 3 of the CPR is uh, shift to its score. Merely states that the POW cannot indiscriminately invoke conflict of interest in cases where its services have been engaged by one of the parties when its assistance is sought by another party. So conflict of interest only sets in for the handling public attorney and his or her, di or her direct supervisor. Another case is Anglo versus Valencia et al. The question or the issue is whether or not the respondents are guilty of representing conflict of interest in violation of the pertinent provisions of the CPR. So the Supreme Court held yes, there is conflict of interest when a lawyer represents inconsistent interest of two or more opposing parties. So the test is whether or not in behalf of one client it is, it is the lawyer's duty to fight for an issue or claim but it is his duty to oppose it for another client in brief if he argues for one client this argument will be opposed by him when he argues for the other client so may pinapaprotekta hanggang right ng isa or may argue ka for this one which is ikaw rin sa sarili mo ang mag-argue because you're representing another client. Okay, so this rule covers not only cases in which confidential communications have been confided, but also those in which no confidence has been bestowed or will be used. Also, there is conflict of interest if the acceptance of the new retainer hmm, will require the authority to perform an act which will injuriously affect his first client in any matter in which he represents him. And also whether he will be called upon in his new relation to use against his first client any knowledge acquired through their connection. Another test of the inconsistency of interest is whether the acceptance of a new relation will prevent an attorney from the full discharge of his duty of undivided fidelity and loyalty to his client or invite suspicion of unfaithfulness or double dealing in the performance thereof. Another case, uh, Passes Industrial or Paces Industrial Corp versus Salandanan. It's a 2017 case. The issue is whether or not Salandanan is guilty of committing malpractice and or gross misconduct when he represented conflicting interests. The Supreme Court held yes under Rule 15, Canon 15 and Canon 21 of the CPR. It is explicit that the law is prohibited from representing new clients whose interests oppose those of a former client in any manner, whether or not they are parties in the same action or on totally unrelated cases. The protection given to the client is perpetual. And here, Salandanan sufficiently represented or intervened for passes or paces in its negotiations for the payment of its obligations to EE Black Limited. His defense for uh, paces was eventually opposed by him when he argued for EE Black Limited. Thus, Salandaran had indisputably obtained knowledge of matters affecting the rights and obligations of paces which had been placed in him in unrestricted confidence. Okay. Uh... Okay, wait lang. I'll just take a break. I'll just drink some water. Okay, now we're back at studying. Now let's discuss the case of Legazpi versus Fajardo. It's a 2018 case. The issue is whether or not Fajardo's alleged acts constituted conflict of interest. The Supreme Court held yes. Here it is clear that the respondent indeed violated the rule on conflict of interest when he entered his appearance for defendant Malino and thereafter accepted his appointment as attorney in fact for Gabriel, who was the plaintiff in the same case. 
and even submitted pleadings and motions on Gabriel's behalf therein. Okay, so these are just the instances or cases where there is conflict of interest. And we have another case which does not uh, violate the conflict of interest. Okay, so it's in the case of Home Guarantee Corp versus Tagayuna. So the respondents in this case, again, did not violate the conflict of interest rule. Because in determining whether a law is guilty of violating the rules on conflict of interest under the CPR, it is essential to determine whether a lawyer, number one, a lawyer is duty bound to fight for an issue or claim in behalf of one client and at the same time to oppose that claim for the other client. Okay, number two, the acceptance of a new relation will prevent the full discharge of a lawyer's duty of undivided fidelity and loyalty to the client or invite suspicion of unfaithfulness or double dealing in the performance of the duty. And number three, a lawyer would be called upon in the new relation to use against the former client any confidential information acquired through their connection or previous employment. Here in this case, the law firm did not represent BSCDC as counsel in the arbitration case. Attorney Tagayuna merely signed as a president to verify the complaint. Further, evidence showed that the law firm and ESP were engaged by the HGC for collection purposes only. There is no proof that the law firm handled matters that were related to the arbitration case. And respondents improperly exercised its right to retain HGC's documents as lien. Any, uh, any money or property collected for the client coming into the lawyer's possession should be promptly declared and reported to the client. Rule 16.3 uh, of the CPR and Section 37, Rule 138 recognizes that a lawyer is entitled to a lien over funds, documents, and papers of his client which have lawfully come into his possession for purposes of satisfying the legal fees and disbursements due to him. So here, the requisites to exercise lien were not met. There is no proof that HCC consented to the respondents withholding of the titles to satisfy the unpaid legal fees. And the court acknowledges the fact that the documents were already returned to HCC during the pendency of this case. So the court deems it proper to reprimand respondents. Uh, we still have uh, uh, lots of uh, cases. So, you can just read it, like in the case of Constantina versus uh, Aran, uh, Aranzazo, where the uh, where attorney Aranzazo violated the rule on privileged communication between uh, attorney and, and his client. We also have the case of Portuguese Junior versus Centro. So, 2021 case. So, uh, yung kanina, 2021 case then. So, Attorney Centro departed from his sworn oath by uh, by his failure to file different uh, legal documents. No? So, there is an unjustifiable negligence and abandonment of his client's case, which is a clear violation of the lawyer's oath as well as the CPR. We also had the case of Villamar versus, uh, versus Jumau as a 2020 case there is uh, also a case of uh, conflicting uh, interest okay another is Parongao versus uh, Lakuanan it's a 2020 case but in this case attorney Lakuanan is not guilty of representing conflicting interest so he is not administrative uh, administratively uh, liable we have the case also of Burgos versus Berebel okay uh, it's also about conflicting interest, but he is not guilty in this in this instance. Okay. Uh, next, we have to discuss limited legal services. So for limited legal services, uh, we have to refer for uh, to services for a uh, specific legal incident. So, with the expectation by the lawyer and the client that the lawyer will not provide continuing legal services in the matter. That's why it's limited. Okay? This includes being appointed as counsel the official 
only for arraignment purposes or special appearances to make any court submission. Also, to give advice, to draft legal documents, to provide legal assistance before courts or administrative bodies and the like. We have also pro bono limited legal service. So, a lawyer appointed by the court as counsel the official shall not refuse to render limited legal serv uh, services pro bono on the ground of conflict of interest. Instead, The lawyer shall disclose to all affected parties such conflict of interest. So even if a lawyer could validly not accept a case, he must not refuse to provide immediate legal advice necessary to protect their rights. And a lawyer currently serving in the government shall not be exempt from pro bono service and may be appointed by any court, tribunal, or other government agency as counsel the official unless prohibited by law or the applicable service rules and regulations or when, when there is a conflict of interest with government. And a lawyer must cease to provide limited legal services to a client when the lawyer becomes aware that there may be an actual or potential conflict of interest except with the written informed consent of the client. If you are a solo practitioner, you also have the responsibility under Canon, uh, Canon 2, Section 25, that in solo practice, you shall ensure that all matters requiring such lawyers' professional skill and judgment are promptly and competently addressed. How about the responsibilities of a law firm? So as a law firm, um, it's a law firm is any private office, partnership, or association exclusively comprised of a lawyer or lawyers engaged to a practice of law, they will hold themselves out as such to the public. So in the choice of a firm name, no false, uh, misleading, or uh, assumed name shall be used. And the contingent use of the name of a deceased, incapacitated or retired partner, is permissible. Okay, so pwede naman, provided that the firm indicates in all its communications that said partner is deceased, incapacitated or retired. So from a very uh, familiar case dito no yung dati yung sa sisip. So now it's uh, permissible it's just that uh, in case of the deceased partner incapacitated or retired it must be communicated. Okay, responsibility of a government lawyer and those in the prosecution service. Okay, so any violation of the CPRA by lawyers in a government service shall be subject to disciplinary action, separate and distinct from liability under pertinent laws or rules. Number two, a lawyer who has left government service shall not engage in private practice pertaining to any matter before the office where he or she used to be connected with in a period of one year from his or her separation from such office. Justices, judges, clerks of court, city, provincial, and regional prosecutors shall not appear before any court within the their, uh, or within the territorial jurisdiction where they previously served within the same period. So, count ka ng one year if you're a government lawyer, lalo na kapag kaya mga nabanggit ko ng justices, judges, clerk of court, because doon sa territorial jurisdiction, for example, RTC, Valenzuela, so hindi ka pwedeng mag-appear sa territorial jurisdiction ng Valenzuela. Okay, lang yun. Ang patlo, after leaving government service, a lawyer shall not accept an engagement which could improperly influence the outcome of the proceedings which the lawyer handled or intervened in, or over which the lawyer previously exercised authority while in said service. Number four, adverse interest conflicts uh, exist where the, ma the matter in which the former government lawyer represents a client in private practice is substantially related to a matter that the lawyer dealt with while employed by the government and the interest of the current and former are adverse. Okay, so the American Bar Association defined uh, matter as any discrete, isolatable act as well as in the identifiable transaction or conduct involving a particular situation and specific party 
and not merely an act of drafting, enforcing, or interpreting government or agency procedures, regulations, or laws, or briefing abstract principles of law. Number six, to intervene only includes an act of a person who has the power to influence the subject proceedings. You have the case of Pasok versus Zapatos. It's 2016 case. So, the respondent here violated the CPR because a lawyer shall not, after leaving government service, accept engagement or employment in connection with any matter in which he had intervened while in said service. Okay, so the respondent in his capacity as the judge of MTCC of Tangub City presided over the case before eventually inhibiting himself from further proceedings. His act of presiding constituted intervention. So the restriction as applied to him lasted beyond his tenure in relation to the matters in which he had intervened as a judge. In the case of Trovella versus Robles, the IBP has no jurisdiction to investigate government lawyers charged with administrative offenses involving the performance of their official duties. So that's the issue. Should the respondents be administratively disciplined based on the allegations of the complainant? The Supreme Court held no. The acts complained of undoubtedly aroused from uh, the respondents' performance or discharge of official duties as prosecutors of the DOJ. Now let's talk about the responsibility of a paralegal. A paralegal is one who performs tasks that require the familiarity with legal concepts employed or retained by a lawyer, law, office, corporation, governmental agency, or other entity for non-diagnostic and non-advisory work in relation to legal matters delegated by such lawyer, law office, corporation, governmental agency, or other entity. So the keyword here is that you are employed for non-diagnostic and non-advisory work. So, a lawyer must direct or supervise a paralegal in the performance of the latter's delegated duties. The lawyer's duty of confidentiality shall also extend okay, to the services rendered by the paralegal who is equally bound to keep the privilege. So, the non-delegable uh, non legal tasks okay, for, uh, for lawyers, okay, so a lawyer shall not delegate uh, or permit a non-lawyer including a paralegal Okay, so bawal kang utusan ng lawyer mo o supervising lawyer mo na to accept cases on behalf of the lawyer, to give legal advice or opinion. Number three is to act independently without the lawyer's supervision or direction. Uh, refer to hold yourself or uh, to hold yourself out as a lawyer or to be or be named in the association with a lawyer in any pleading, okay, or submission to any court, tribunal, or government agency. You cannot also appear in any court, tribunal, or other government agency or actively participate in formal legal proceedings on behalf of a client except, okay, we have an exception when allowed by the law or the rules. Of course, we have those kinds of uh, rules, right? If you are a law student for law student practice, okay. So, uh, we also have, uh, we also cannot conduct negotiations with third uh, parties unless allowed in administrative agencies without a lawyer's supervision or direction. Next is to sign correspondence containing a legal opinion. When, uh, paralegals cannot also do that. And to perform any of the duties that only lawyers may undertake. So it's a catch provision that you cannot uh, do anything which a lawyer, which only a lawyer can do. Now let's talk about responsibility of lawyers in the academe. So for lawyers in the academe, a lawyer serving as a dean, admin officer, or faculty member of an educational institution shall at all times adhere to the standards of behavior required of the members of the legal profession under the CPRA by observing propriety, respectability, and decorum inside and outside the classroom and in all media. Okay, so, medyo, ah, uh, na lang. Okay, I hope you bear with me. Uh, let's continue. 
Uh, so, responsibility of law firms, supervisory and supervised lawyers. Okay, ito naman sa law firms. Hmm. So, for law firms, oh, a lawyer law firm shall be responsible for the mistakes, negligence, or acts or omissions of a subordinate lawyer. Hindi lang subordinate lawyer, even the paralegal or employee under the lawyer's direct supervision and control who is acting within the scope of the assigned task that cause damage or injury which brings dishonor to the profession or violates the rule on confidentiality. However, such liability of a supervising lawyer does not attach upon proof of exercise of diligence of a good parent of a family. In this election and supervision of subordinate lawyer, paralegal, or employee. And a supervisory lawyer shall cause sign a pleading or other submission to any court, tribunal, or other government agency with a supervised lawyer. A supervisory lawyer shall be responsible for a violation of the CPRA by the supervised lawyer in any of the following instances. That the supervisory lawyer orders or directs the specific conduct or with knowledge of the uh, specific conduct ratif uh, ratifies it or the supervisory lawyer knows of such conduct at a time when it could be prevented or its consequences avoided or mitigated but fails to take reasonable remedial action or that the supervisory lawyer should have known of the conduct so that reasonable remedial action could have been taken at a time when the consequences of the conduct could have been avoided or mitigated. So a supervisory lawyer is a lawyer having direct supervisory authority over another lawyer, including a supervising lawyer under Rule 138A uh, of the Rules of Court. Let's talk about the responsibility of a legal clinic. So a law student clinic director and supervising lawyer under Rule 138A of the Rules of Court shall provide meaningful training to law students. They shall assume responsibility for any work performed by the law student while under their supervision and shall comply with all the laws, rules, and guidelines pertaining to the law student practice. Now let's go to attorney's fees. Okay. Attorney's fees shall be deemed fair and reasonable. Okay, if deemed uh, or if determined based on the following factors. So, ito yung mga factors to determine. First, the time spent and the extent of the service rendered or required. Number two, the novelty and difficulty of the issues involved. Number three, the skill or expertise of the lawyer, including the level of study and experience required for the engagement. Number four is the probability of losing other engagements as a result of acceptance of the case. Number five is the customary charges for similar uh, services and the recommended schedule of fees which the IBP chapter shall provide. Okay, so next, the quantitative or qualitative value of the client's interest in the engagement or the benefits resulting to the client from the service. Another is the contingency or certainty of compensation. Next is the character of the engagement, whether limited, seasonal, or otherwise, and such other analogous factors. So there are two concepts of attorney's fees. For ordinary, it is the reasonable compensation paid to a lawyer for legal services rendered. For extraordinary, it is an indemnity for damages ordered by the court to be paid by the losing party to the prevailing party in a litigation. So it is payable to the client unless it has been agreed that the award shall pertain to the lawyer as additional compensation or part thereof. For acceptance fees, acceptance of money from a client establishes an attorney-client relationship and it gives rise to the duty of fidelity to the client's cause. But failure, okay, failure to render the legal services agreed upon despite receipt of an acceptance fee is a clear violation of the CPR. So we also have a uh, contingency fee arrangements, okay? 
Uh, we have the case of Cortez versus Cortez. The issue in this case is whether or not the acts complained of constitute misconduct on the part of attorney Cortez, uh, which would subject him to disciplinary action. The Supreme Court held, yes, a contingent fee arrangement is valid in this jurisdiction but must be laid down in an express contract. So, a much higher compensation is allowed as contingent fee in consideration of the risk that the lawyer may get nothing if the suit fails. So, contracts of this nature are permitted because they are down to the benefit of the poor client and the lawyer, especially in cases where the client has meritorious cause of action, but no means with, uh, with which to pay for legal services unless he can, with the sanction of law, make a contract for contingent fee to be paid out of the proceeds of the litigation. So in this case, complainant alleges that the contingency fee was fixed at 12% by a handshake agreement, while attorney Cortez counters that the agreement was 50%. Although we agree that the 50% uh, contingency was excessive, we do not agree that the 10% limitation as provided in Article 111 is automatically applicable because under Article uh, 111 of the Labor Code deals with the extraordinary uh, concept of attorney's fees. But it would appear that the uh, contingency fees that the attorney fee court has required is in the ordinary sense as it represents reasonable compensation for legal services he rendered for complainant. Necessarily, the 10% limitation of the labor code would not be applicable beyond the limit fixed by Article 3, such as between the lawyer and the client, the attorney's fees may exceed 10% on the basis of quantum merit. So, Chamber 2's contracts are void, okay, where the lawyer agrees to spend for all litigation expenses in consideration for a bigger percentage as fees on the property subject of litigation. It is against public policy. So, the, we also have the principle of quantum merit. So, quantum merit means as much as he has deserved. So, it's recovery of attorney's fees based on uh, based on that, based on what the lawyer deserves, no, so, so services niya, okay, so it is authorized when there is no express contract for the payment of attorney's fees. Number two, where the stipulated fees are unconscionable. Number three, when the contract is void due to formal matters. Number four, when the counsel was not able to finish the case to its conclusion for justifiable reasons. Next is when the parties both disregard the contract. So legal interest cannot be imposed on attorney's fees. Okay? And the award of attorney's fees must be deleted where the award of moral and exemplary, uh, exemplary damages are eliminated. So when is a fee considered reasonable? If it is within capacity of the client to pay, and it is directly commensurate with the value of the legal uh, legal services rendered. So division of fees in proportion to the work performed and responsibility assumed. Okay, so it is improper for a lawyer to receive compensation for merely recommending uh, another lawyer to his client and render no legal services at all. Okay, also the duty not to accept any fee or other compensation whatsoever related to his professional employment from anyone other than the client. While the only exception to this rule is that whereby a lawyer may receive compensation from a person other than his client is when the latter has full knowledge and approval thereof. So there's a case in Sanchez v. Aguilos, the issue is whether or not Aguilos should be held administrative liable for misconduct in order to return the attorney's fees paid. The Supreme Court said, yes! A reading of the answer filed by the respondent would show that he himself is not well versed in the grounds for legal separation. Clearly, the respondent misrepresented his professional competence and skill to the complainant. He thus transgressed Canon 18 and Rules 18.1.2 and 0.3. So we cannot see the court said that we cannot see how the respondent deserved any compensation because he did not really begin to perform the complete, uh, contemplated task. If even based on dispersion, he would prepare the petition for legal separation instead of the petition for annulment of marriage. So the attorney who fails to accomplish the task that he should naturally and expectedly perform during his professional engagement 
does not discharge his professional responsibility and ethical duty toward his client. Next, we'll discuss what is attorney's lien. Okay. Attorney's lien. In case of non-payment of attorney's fees, a lawyer may resort to the enforcement of the attorney's lien under Canon 3, Section 54 by filing a notice of enforcement of attorney's lien with the court, tribunal, or other government agency of origin where the action or proceeding the lawyer rendered service for is pending without prejudice to the other remedies under the law or the rules of court. The notice shall be accompanied by proof of the services rendered and served on the client, the court tribunal or other government agency after hearing shall determine the lawyer's entitlement to the claim fees. Uh, the enforcement of an attorney's lien shall be treated as an independent claim and in, uh, shall in no instance delay the resolution of the main case. The resolution of the lawyer's claim may be included in the main judgment or in a separate partial judgment. Okay, In the case of partial judgment, the same shall be subject of appeal. So, an appeal in the main case shall not stay the execution of the lawyer's lien. In the execution of the judgment in the main case, the court shall give due consideration to the pending claim of the lawyer. So, if the claim for the attorney's lien arises after a decision has been rendered by the court or tribunal or government agency, uh, the claim for the enforcement of the lien shall be by an independent action. Retaining lien. So, upon the funds, documents, and papers of his client which have lawfully come into his possession and may retain the same until his lawful fees and disbursements have been paid and may apply such funds for uh, to the satisfaction thereof. You have also a charging lien. It is, it is to the same extent upon all judgments for the payment of money we have uh, so for retaining lien uh, the requisites for its uh, valid exercise is that there must be a client lawyer relationship uh, there must be a claims for attorney's fees that are not satisfied next is that the council number three is that the council is in possession of the subject papers documents and funds and lastly that the possession is lawful. So charging lien is the equitable right of the attorney to have the fees due him for services in a particular suit secured by the judgment or recovery in such suit. So dito naman ang requisites nito, ganun din, may client-lawyer relationship. Pangalawa, may favorable judgment secured by the counsel for his client which judgment is a money judgment. So, important na it is a money judgment. So, pangatlo, noting into the records of the case through the filing of an appropriate motion of the statement of the lawyer's claim for attorney's fees with copies furnished the client and the adverse party. So, the charging lien may be enforced against the client or against the judgment debtor. So, let's differentiate retaining lien and charging lien. Pag-retaining lien, ang nature nito, passive. So, it is a general lien. So, charging lien, it's an active. So, it can only be enforced by execution. That's why it's called a special lien. So, what's the basis? Ang basis ng retaining lien is that lawful possession of papers, documents, property of the client. So, charging lien naman, ang basis nito is securing of a favorable money judgment for the client. The coverage. The coverage of retaining lien are the papers, documents, and property. So, charging lien, it covers all judgments for the payment of money and executions issued. So as to effectivity, it is effect so retaining lien, it is effective as soon as possession is had. So, charging lien, as soon as the claim had been entered into the records of the case. So, notice, client uh, sorry, client need not be notified for retaining lien. So, charging lien, client and adverse party must be notified. As to applicability, uh, retaining in retaining lien, it may be exercised before judgment or execution or regardless thereof. So, charging lien, it is general, uh, generally exercisable only 
when the attorney had already secured a favorable judgment for his client. We have a case of Dominguez versus Bank of Commerce. It's a 2021 case. The trial courts are not preclude, uh, precluded from adjudicating money claims such as attorney's fees in a petition for cancellation of adverse claim. So in petitions for cancellation of adverse claim, trial courts are not precluded from adjudicating matters involving attorney's fees. Because registration or recording of attorney's lien merely recognizes the right of the lawyer to claim from the judgment of the suit Whereas the lien can only be enforced when the money judgment in favor of the counsel's client becomes final and executory. Okay. So we also have to discuss prohibitions on lending and borrowing. So yon. We also have exceptions to the no no to that rule. At under section fifty two. During the existence of the lawyer-client relationship, a lawyer shall not lend money to a client except under urgent and justifiable circumstances. Advances for uh, professional fees and necessary expenses in a legal matter, the lawyer is handling for a client shall not be covered by this rule. So neither shall a lawyer borrow money from a client during the existence of the lawyer-client relationship unless the client's interests are fully protected by the nature of the case or by the independent advice. But this rule shall not apply to standard commercial transactions for products or services that the client offers to the public in general. Number is where the lawyer and the client have an existing or prior business relationship or when there is a contract between the lawyer and the client. Let's talk about prohibition against acquiring interest in the object of litigation or transaction. Because a lawyer shall not acquire directly or indirectly a proprietary interest in the property or rights which is the object of any litigation or transaction in which the lawyer may take part by virtue of the profession. So termination of engagement by the lawyer. Ito may pag-usapan natin. Termination of engagement by the lawyer. So, a lawyer shall, uh, shall terminate the lawyer-client engagement only for good cause and upon written notice in any of the following cases. First, when the client pursues an illegal or immoral course of conduct in connection with the engagement. Number two, when the client insists that the lawyer pursue conduct that is violative of these canons and rules. Number three, is when the lawyer's inability to work with a co-counsel will not promote the best interest of the client. Number four, when the moral predisposition of the mental or physical condition of the lawyer renders it difficult to carry out the engagement effectively. Next, when the client deliberately fails to pay the fees for the lawyer's services, fails to comply with the retainer agreement, or can no longer be found despite diligent efforts. Next is that when the lawyer is elected or appointed to public office or other similar cases. Next, let's talk about termination of engagement by the client. So, the lawyer-client engagement may be terminated by the client at any time upon loss of trust and confidence. So, the termination of the engagement shall not relieve the client from full payment, full payment of the pre professional fees due to the lawyer. If the engagement has been reduced to writing, the lawyer shall be entitled to recover from the client the full compensation stipulated unless found by the court, tribunal, or other government agency to be unconscionable or unreasonable under Canon 3, Section 41 of the CPRA. So for the payment of compensation, the lawyer shall have a charging lien upon all judgments for the payment of money and executions issued in pursuance of such judgment, rendered in the case where the lawyer's services had been retained by the client. Termination of engagement upon death. So, kanina, by the lawyer, second, yung by the client, ito naman, upon death. So, the death of the lawyer or client, either, no, the death of the lawyer or client shall terminate the lawyer-client relationship. The death of such lawyer shall not extinguish the lawyer-client engagement between the law firm and the client handled by such law firm. Now, let's talk about accounting and turnover of funds and properties upon termination of judgment. So, ito na yung after ma-terminate, what happens next is there will be an accounting and turnover of funds. 
So a lawyer who is discharged from or terminates the engagement shall subject uh, shall subject to an attorney's lien immediately render a full account of and turn over all documents, evidence, funds, and properties belonging to the client. So the lawyer shall cooperate with the chosen successor in, uh, in the orderly transfer of the legal matter, including all information necessary for the efficient handling of the client's representation. And lastly, a lawyer shall have a lien upon the funds, documents, and papers of the client which have lawfully come into his or her uh, possession and may retain the same until the fair and reasonable fees and disbursements have been paid and may apply such funds to the satisfaction thereof. So, yun lang for Canon 3. Next is, we'll be discussing about Canon 4.